Today, we'll be talking about regeneration. Regeneration. This is a branch from soteriology. Remember, we're going through our theological studies. So in theological studies, there are many different branches, soteriology, pneumatology, Christology, etc. We're going to cover one of those ologies, which is soteriology. That means the doctrine of salvation. Regeneration is one of them. So we're going to explain about what regeneration truly is, what it means. All of us heard that before in some way or form in other churches. Born again, new birth, and born twice, regenerate. But even though we know these terms, the problem with Christians nowadays is that we just take these terms as for granted and put it in our heads. But if I were to test you or ask you, what does regeneration really mean? All of us would struggle answering that. That's why it's important when you hear these familiar terms that it's not just a head knowledge, but you really know what it means. That's why it's important to examine these terms. No, these are not basic doctrines. No, regeneration is not a basic doctrine that you already know that you don't need to learn. You got to realize that if you are actually questioned about this, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. You just think you know because it's all head knowledge, right? So that's why it's going to be important that we examine what regeneration really means and where we get these ideas, these wordings from. Why do pastors say born again, born twice, new birth, regenerate? And what does that really mean? So let's cover that. And the first area that we'd obviously want to cover is the definition. So if we look at the definition right here for regenerate, Webster's 1828 dictionary as usual, regenerate. From here, it comes out it, from definition number one, to generate or produce anew, reproduce. Now you'll notice that, anew, right? That's where we get the idea of new birth. Generate or produce to reproduce, that's giving birth, right? right? So you can guess why we put new birth with regeneration. If you say born again is redemption, then you're incorrect. If you say born again is believing on Jesus Christ, that's also incorrect too. You might say, why? Because born again does not mean believing on Jesus Christ. Born again does not mean redeeming. Born again, what it means is to give birth. That's where we get the idea about new birth. True believing on Jesus Christ is involved. Redemption is involved. Salvation is involved. All these other things are involved, but that's not what it means. So you have to understand that. So we know that regenerate means new birth, but the clue is already given right here. See that? So generate... That's like generation. So a new bloodline, so to speak. A new seed. That's why when you look at the Bible, it talks about <coughs> new seed, incorruptible seed, spiritual seed. What does all that mean? It relates to re regeneration because of generation, a new generation, a spiritual generation etc. Re means again. That's why we say second birth. See that? Because it's like repeating. That's why we say new birth. That's why we even say spiritual birth. Why? Because spiritual birth is a repetition. You're getting born again, so to speak, because all of you are already born physically. So all of us have been born before, obviously, otherwise you wouldn't exist. So then when we get this other birth, that's our born again line. That's our spiritual birth, our spiritual generation. So regenerate, that's self-explanatory right there. Again and generation, that's the idea. So we now know what regeneration means. That's where we get the idea of born again. That's what it can basically define, be defined as. Now in John chapter 3, verse 3, 
Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, and this is a classic uh, passage on born again. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, that's obviously confusing to Nicodemus. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So notice it was already explained to you, or Jesus is about to explain to you what born again is. Because Nicodemus was confused. What do you mean by being born again? I'm already born from my mother. How do I get born again from my mother's womb? So Jesus now, see, he has to explain that. No, I'm not talking about something physical, Nicodemus. I'm talking about something spiritual. There is a difference with a physical and spiritual birth. He actually said that. But a lot of churches missed out on that interpretation. Instead, they made up their own interpretation here. So look at this, okay? You'll see how it matches up with Scripture, verse 5. <clears throat> the Bible points out right here, uh, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So notice that explanation matches up with this passage. Jesus did say that. He's trying to tell Nicodemus, I know that everyone has a physical birth. People are born from water. So we have that physical birth. We, we're all born from water. But then I'm talking about a spiritual birth. I'm talking about the spirit here. That's what born again is. So we all got the physical birth, first birth. But your second birth is your spiritual birth. That's what Jesus basically said from verses 5 through 7. That's why regeneration can also be called second birth. 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5. Now John, who is the same writer of the book of John, writes in this epistle that if you are born again, that means you're, you come from God's family. You're born from God's family. That's why you don't have to get born from your mother's womb physically because this birth is God-giving birth, God-creating you. Go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is, notice right here what? Begotten of him. So notice right here that we are all born of from God. That's what the new birth is talking about. When John says being born of God, there's no doubt it's matching with John 3, the new birth. You might say, why? Because it's the same author writing. Otherwise, what kind of birth is he talking about here? So there is no doubt that the new birth is in relation to God's family. That must mean it's spiritual. It's not physical. So it makes all sense now when we tie these verses together. All right, go to 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5. Now, I hope that you're paying attention to my explanation and not thinking that, oh, I already know, I already know. No, because you can't just hear my explanation and believe it, okay? Let me repeat that again. You can't just hear my explanation and believe it. You got to, a lot of pastors say a lot of spiritual stuff and what sounds biblical, but how do you really know? Okay. See, the only way you can know is from that book. So you have to look at the Bible and see if from the Bible my explanation is matching up with the verse. Right. You can't just say, uh-huh, uh-huh, it makes sense. No, how do you know it makes sense? Look at the verse. Yeah. The verse could be referring to something else. Here, let me give you an example. 1 John 5, 1 never said spiritual birth. It never said that. So how do you know that when I said born of God, it's referring to a spiritual birth? Any of you got an answer? See, so you have to pay attention to how I'm explaining to you. When in my explanation, I showed you why it's a spiritual birth. I said because it's born from God. 
So it's not physical. So it's got to be spiritual. See, I already gave an answer. I also gave another answer. John is the same writer. So since John's the same writer, we just look at John 3. He's talked about being born of the Spirit. See? So you have to pay attention. All right? You can't just hear and say, oh, it makes sense, makes sense. Oh, no, no, no. How do you know it makes sense? Look at the verse. That's the best way to start. Look at the verse and say, wait a minute. What he's saying right here, it doesn't seem to match up right here. I wonder if there's something missing. Then you'll pay attention more, and then as you keep listening to my explanation, you're going to go, oh, okay, I see. That's why he's explaining it that way. All right, so I hope that can help you. All right? Go to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 5, 17. The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, notice right here, what's very important is when you get in Jesus Christ, see that? So it shows right here salvation. When you become in Jesus Christ, so that must mean that you got saved, then what happens is you become a new creature right here. So you are not the same old creature as before. So think about this. Uh, the Bible talked about new birth. The Bible talked about being born from God's family, right? So, and it talked about regeneration, right? There's that transformation, that change. That's why 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is going to match up in that. It's going to match up with the regeneration verses. Why? Notice you get in Christ. That means you become a part of God's spiritual family. When you become a part of God's spiritual family, notice that you become a new creature. Think about it. It's logical. If you get the new birth, see, you start something new. So there's a new you that came out. See, that's the new creature. Hence, now we understand what old creature, new creature means. Old creature then must mean the physical you right now, your flesh. New creatures got to be referring to the spiritual you. Okay, so now we've established that regeneration can be called the new birth. Why? Why do we call it new birth? Because of new creature, that's why. 2 Corinthians 5.17. So when you hear these terms, new birth, second birth, born again, we can't just be making up terms. There's got to be a biblical evidence for that. What's your biblical evidence? Uh, I don't know. No, now you know. You got the verses. Okay. John chapter 3 again. John chapter 3. All right. The next part is the necessity of regeneration. The necessity of regeneration. In other words, there are no exceptions. It is very important to be born again. You might say, uh, why is it necessary for me to become born again? The reason why is because your salvation is dependent on that. For you to go to heaven or hell, for you to be righteous in Jesus Christ, you need that regeneration. A lot of people don't think about this. If you don't have the new birth, then that means you have no spiritual nature. You have no spiritual side to you, just your fleshly side. Okay, if you have just your fleshly side, think about it. Don't you still sin in your flesh? Okay. Yeah, we all do. Uh, everybody is still in the flesh. If people still sin in the flesh, then what that means is, then God sees sin in you, and how can a holy God get you to heaven after that? But if God sees just your spiritual side, because that's how you got saved, right? When you get saved and he only sees the spiritual side, that's why he can take you to heaven, because he's not concentrating, focusing on your fleshly side. He's looking at your spiritual side. When he calls you my child, my son, 
basically he's not seeing how you behave in your flesh. That's why people keep thinking they can lose salvation. That's why people think they're not good enough, they don't qualify to be God's family, and they can be saved. But if, you're, if God calls you my child based on not your fleshly side, but your spiritual side, see that? It makes sense then. It makes sense that, ah, you're qualified to go to heaven. You're qualified to be his son. Why? Because God put something spiritual in you. Mm -hmm. And that spiritual nature has no sin in it. Right. It makes a lot more sense that way. Okay, so let's look at John chapter 3 again. John chapter 3. Notice right there that there are no exceptions to this. John chapter 3, verse 3, the Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man. See that? Except. See that? So it shows right here about that there, there's going to be no exceptions. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It points out right here, you cannot go to heaven no matter what. You'll never be saved unless you have this exception, which is the new birth. Meaning then, no exceptions to this. You have to get regeneration. Go to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15. If you are not a new creature, which means regeneration, by getting saved in Jesus Christ, then nothing avails, no matter what kind of person you become. In other words, think about, it makes a lot more sense now. It makes a lot more sense that no matter how good you live your life, and you could do more good works than me. You can s stay away from sin more than me. You can read that book, pray, be holy, and still burn in hell for all eternity. What a cruel God. Why would he do something like that? See, a lot of people don't think those are the works of the flesh. What? Works of the flesh. So that's why it's important to understand that according to God, that you need the regeneration because no matter how good you live in your flesh, it's not going to count. Salvation won't count. He has to see the spiritual side in you. He has to see the spiritual seed. Doesn't avail. That's why this is so necessary, regeneration. It makes more sense now. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15, the Bible says, for in Christ Jesus. Remember 2 Corinthians 5, 17? You got to get in Christ. If you don't get in Christ, what happens? Neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but what? A new creature. See, what God's looking at is nothing you do outwardly in your flesh. He's looking only what? Inside you, that spiritual nature. New creature. New creature. That's what counts. So the question is, are you born again? The question is not, are you baptized? Do you stay away from sin? Are you a Christian? Do you go to church? No, that's not the question. The question is, are you born again? Go to Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13. It's important to understand no one can change their old sinful ways. Let me repeat that again. No one can change their old sinful ways. No matter how much you might brag that, oh, hey, you know, I beat my alcohol addiction, I beat my drugs, and I'm an atheist, and I'm doing fine. I don't need what you Christians call new birth. Some people might boast themselves to be Catholic or Seventh-day Adventist and say that they stayed away from sin and that they're living for God. And some people might argue that they don't need salvation by faith. They don't need this regeneration. However, if you're going to be totally honest, it doesn't matter how many times you stopped acting, how many have you thought about it in your mind? Okay. How many times have you felt it in your heart? Yeah. Come on, man. Just because you didn't do anything outwardly in your behavior doesn't mean that your flesh didn't sin. The flesh sure sinned a lot in the heart and then in the mind and everything. See, a lot of people don't look at that. Okay. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 13 and then verse 23. The Bible points out, can the Ethiopian change his skin, a skin, excuse me, or the leopard his spots? 
Then look at this. Look at this. May ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Wow, what a negative verse. Jeremiah is saying right here that uh, just like in our nature, in our natural world, they can't change their outward spots or their skin. So it's the same thing that, hey, there's hope for you that you can do good if you've been accustomed to do evil. Meaning then, just as the natural laws of science, how we were born, it won't, it's, the laws apply to the spiritual laws. You won't change. You won't change. All right, so let's look at another one. Chapter 17, verse 9. Chapter 17, verse 9. No, you're not going to do good, even though you think you are. There's somewhere deep down inside your heart that still old habits are hard to die. Old habits still creep in. They come back. You can live your life as a saved Christian 20 years, and you'd be surprised. Some of those old things just keep popping up in your dreams. All right. A lot of people don't think about that. Go to Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. The Bible says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The question over here is, you might think that you know you're not sinning, but your sin is so deceptive that you lose track of it. Some of you don't even know it. So no one can change their old sinful ways, to be honest. No one can change their old sinful ways. You know how you're going to change your old sinful ways? The only way you can change your old sinful ways is if you have the spiritual nature in you. So that's why the necessity of regeneration is important. With that Holy Spirit inside you, don't forget 2 Corinthians 5.17, right? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So the old things that you're used to doing in your flesh, Jeremiah argues there's no way that you can do it. But 2 Corinthians 5 shows you the hope that it can be overcome becoming a new creature, regeneration. So when you get saved in Jesus Christ, now you have the Holy Spirit inside you that you can yield, that you can perform an act that will empower you, that will strengthen and help you conquer the old sinful things. That's why it's very important to have regeneration. Okay, now uh, the nature of regeneration. We're going to look at John chapter 3 again. John chapter 3. Now, notice the necessity right here. Notice the, reset, the necessity from this picture of regeneration. Oh, I didn't switch it yet. A person, before they get born again, before they get saved, we see right here the blackness uh, over here, and then we see the the red over here, but what we could look at is the body. So we can see right here the corruption of sin. However, notice that the spirit, which is blue, when you get saved, now the pink is soul, the blue is spirit. But then notice right here the pinkish is being replaced more by the blue. But right here, we could say that this is flesh. Your soul is being contaminated by the old ways of the flesh before you got saved. When you get saved, now it's all blue. The Lord puts something new inside you. Old things are passed away. That fleshly sinful stuff is gone. And God puts the, the spiritual nature in there. Now the soul becomes part of the spiritual nature. But as you keep cleaning off and as you keep growing in the spirit, notice it can be replaced like this. The spiritual nature can grow. So if you want the fleshly stuff to be gone, you cannot do it unless you get something blue in there. That's the bottom line. In other words, that blue <clears throat> is the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. So go to John chapter 3 again. The nature of regeneration. 
In other words, a lot of people misunderstand what regeneration is. What does regeneration actually do? We covered the definition, it means to be born again, simple. But a lot of people don't understand how this process this operates. They think that water baptism is involved because of John 3. If you look at right there, <clears throat> people will assume at verse 5, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water. See that? That's why they assume water baptism in order to receive the born again process. And of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So the church of Christ or the Campbellites or other cults, they believe in a doctrine called baptismal regeneration. See that? Regeneration, they mix it up with baptism. That's why they call it baptismal regeneration. When you hear that, that's not something that you should agree with just because it sounds Christian. See that? That's the danger of head knowledge again. The danger of head knowledge is when you hear something that sounds Christian, you automatically believe it. See, you can't just do that. You have to look at the verse. You have to look at the verse. There are so many different terms now that sound Christian, but they're totally outlandish. They're not scriptural. So you have to be careful of that nowadays. <clears throat> when you uh, look at this verse, we can see what regeneration is. It has nothing to do with baptism. You might say, why? Because one, it never said baptism. It's that simple. It never said baptism. Clue number one, who would have thunk? But it said water. Well, you know, the Bible talks about the whole world was drowned by a flood full of water when Noah's flood came. Does that mean they all got baptized and they went to heaven? Yeah, yeah. See, when you see the word water, you can't just automatically assume baptism. You can't do that. Okay, let's look at, uh, uh, let's see right here, John chapter 3, and then we'll look at verse 3. John chapter 3, and we'll look at verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, Okay, so Jesus is talking about you got to be born again to go to heaven. So Nicodemus is asking him a question at verse 4. How do I get born again? Do I go twice into my mother's womb? So Jesus has to explain that, right? Jesus has to explain what born again is. So in verse 5, verse 5, Jesus answered, except a man be born of water and, see that? Meaning... There's two things. So can you guess the answer then already? So he's telling you two things. Two things to be born. Born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Then verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Notice he's talking about two things right here regarding the birth again. Why, what's he talking about then? When he says born again, being born twice, it's already self-explanatory then. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. There's your first birth. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's your second birth. See that? If you're born of water, that's your first birth. Born of spirit, that's your second birth. Why then the answer is already given. Your first birth is obvious. Physical birth, second birth is spiritual birth. That's why we say born again. Because all of you are already born. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. That's your physical birth. Yeah. But born again is referring to your spiritual birth. Uh, don't people say that uh, her water broke when she's about to give birth? See, every one of us, when we got the physical birth, were, was born from water. So it's already self-explanatory right here. It uh, has nothing to do with water baptism. It's pretty obvious. Okay. So the first thing about regeneration that we've learned is that it has nothing to do uh, with water baptism. Let's go to Titus chapter 3. Titus 3. Titus chapter 3. Now there are two verses that you have to be wary of when people start talking about regeneration. The two dangerous passages that you want to be wary of is John chapter 3. Now, I know John chapter 3 was where we based off regeneration, but the cults have 
used it to give a wrong definition as well. So you have to be wary of that. So then, what have we learned in John chapter 3? In John chapter 3, you have to be wary of this because their favorite passage is verse 5. Cults use verse 5 to establish about regeneration has to do with born of water. So then they talk about baptismal regeneration. So point number one in the nature of regeneration is that it is not baptism. It is not baptismal regeneration. That's the first thing you want to know about the nature of regeneration. All right, the second passage that's also dangerous, all right? It connects to sometimes water baptism, people will use it. And that's Titus chapter 3. And let me show it right here on this board as well. Titus 3, 5. Look at right here, okay? So he, notice right here, it has to do with regeneration, but people will mistakenly use it for something else. Titus 3, 5, notice the Bible says that uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Uh, so, the other thing that you have to avoid about regeneration right here is it is not reformation. It is not reformation. Meaning that some people assume that, oh, you have to be reformed. You have to be, uh, amend your old ways in order to be regenerated. If I don't see any reformation, if I don't see changes in your life, then that means you are not regenerated. No, re regeneration is not reformation. You don't have to change your ways in life. That's not what it is. Amen. Why? Because it says right here, not by works of righteousness, but rather regeneration. What does that mean? Then regeneration doesn't mean works that you have to do in your life. It's that simple. And then the cults, they look at washing right here. See that? Anything that has to do with washing dishes or soap dish, they automatically will put baptism right there. You take a, a tub full of water, they'll automatically assume baptism. No, I just want to take a bath. That's it. See, that's what people do all the time. That's what people do all the time. I, I wonder, when Jesus was washing the feet of the disciples, how many cults assumed that was water baptism? And I'm being serious, too. You think that I'm joking or poking fun at them, but no, you would be surprised how many of them might be using that verse for water baptism. You might say, why? Because that's the mentality, is to automatically assume that anything that indicates or ties to water will have to do with baptism. But that has nothing to do with that. So regeneration washes you. Why? Because of the Holy Ghost, obviously. So the Holy Ghost washes you anew. See, old things are washed away by the Holy Ghost. The whole, do you really think the Holy Ghost needs water to do the job? Holy Ghost, by its own power, can wash it away. It's that simple. So it's important, again, to realize that there are two things right here. So one is it's not re baptismal regeneration. Second, it's not reformation. We've established that. So then the third thing that we realize on what regeneration is, is based off of Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Regeneration is what? It's a renewing. That's what it is. It's a renewing. Notice when you compare Titus 3, 5, notice that it says washing of regeneration and renewing, right, of the Holy Ghost. Do you see that? So the Holy Ghost makes you anew. That's where we get the idea, new creature, from 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Galatians 6. Now compare that with Ephesians 2. Go to Ephesians 2. Okay. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2. You might say, why does God have to renew me? Do you know what renew means? It means to make alive. Amen. Make alive. Because something died. Something died. So a lot of people 
hence realize that they've been spiritually dead where do we get that term from that idea from do you know the only verse you'll get it from is this passage ephesians 2 1. this shows that we're all spiritually dead before we got saved that's why when you get saved regenerated see that dead thing has become alive got born see that's your spiritual nature ephesians 2 1 and you have the what quicken, quicken means to make alive Glory who were dead in trespasses and sins see you were once dead because of your sins well obviously that's not your physical because you're all alive that has to do with your spiritual then common sense your first birth obviously made your body alive right so your second birth obviously made your spirit alive that's simple hence regeneration so we now know what regeneration is it is a renewing and we know the two things that regeneration is not it's not baptism and it's not reformation all right let's go to james chapter one james chapter one there are two agents for regeneration again there are two agents for regeneration so if you want someone to get the spiritual birth to get born again the two agents are going to be the holy spirit and the word of god the holy spirit and the word of god so you'll notice right here uh, from this picture it, dem it, it displays that picture about the holy spirit and the word of god they tie together they're the ones that are supposed to uh, make you alive puts some spiritual family within you you can see the power behind those two beings so the first one is the word of god james 1 18 the bible says of his own will begat he us see that begat that means to give birth to you that ties to regeneration with the what the word of truth all right uh let's look at first peter 1 first peter chapter 1 verse 23 first Peter chapter 1 verse 23 notice right here when Peter talks about being born again it's from the Word of God when he talks about an incorruptible seed that means like a spiritual family spiritual generation the Bible says right here first Peter 1 23 being born again see that not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the what Word of God all right uh, look at John 3 again John chapter 3 you wonder why so many people in churches are not saved simple answer you ever seen that pastor open up that book everybody's looking too much at screens or pastor dancing and singing hardly pastor talks he's just giving you cute little sayings maybe one verse or two and that's it Plus, you got a gazillion different Bible versions on top of that, not something consistent. See, so then it just, you're not getting the word. No wonder a lot of people are lost. They're not saved. It's the lack of Bible. John chapter 3, verse 5 through 8, verse 5 through 8. So the second agent, which is obvious, is the Holy Spirit. In verse 5, the Bible says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the what? spirit so you need the holy spirit to get involved verse six notice right here the holy spirit to be involved verse seven born again verse eight describes the holy spirit the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth so is everyone that is born of the spirit so the spirit is someone invisible that you cannot see but you do know that the wind because it's blowing wherever it goes so wherever something spiritual blows and goes uh, you can tell that the holy spirit is involved over there all right uh let's see right here the methods of regeneration let's look at uh, john 1 and james 1 again james well you don't have to turn to james 1 but go to john 1 but I want you to write down James chapter 1, verse 18. James chapter 1, 
verse 18. The next section is the methods of regeneration. Methods of regeneration. So we looked at the agents of regeneration, which is the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Now we're going to look at the methods of regeneration. In other words, we have to see what methods have been implemented where you can get born again. You can't, uh, it's not just like God putting you and making you born again. He had to use certain methods and tools that would operate the process. So we have to find out how he did it. So obviously then, if God is involved, then there needs to be a divine side. So that's the first thing. The first thing is God has to be the one. He has to put his power in there. He has to put his spirit in there. All right, so God has to do it from his own power, uh, put the birth in you. So notice in John 1, 13, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of what? Okay, so this is not talking about a physical birth, obviously. This is talking about being born spiritually, but notice that God has to be the one to do it. So this is important to understand, all right? Now, I'm not, uh, I'll clarify Calvinism, all right? I'm not a Calvinist, all right? Sorry for some of you if I disappointed you, but I'm not a Calvinist. But it is important to know that your free will right here has nothing to do to make you born again. Now, uh, that's why I had to give that disclaimer that I'm not a Calvinist, because Calvinists will go, oh, amen, praise the Lord, yeah, glory to God, you know? I knew you would go to our side. Because you have to realize this, okay? It is true you believe on Jesus Christ for your salvation. Don't get me wrong on that. Your free will. But what good is it if any free will or action you do, but God's power has nothing to do with it? See, that's the important thing. If The reason why when you believe on Christ that you're saved is because God's will was involved in that. God put his power into that. If there was no God, what's the point on believing Jesus died, buried, and resurrected? See that? If God's power is not real, what's the point of believing that Jesus or the gospel can save you? Then it's all fake. So you have to realize that your free will has nothing to do with it. Your action has nothing to do with it. If there is no God involved, it's a completely God thing, all right? It's God's will, God's will, God's involvement, God's rule. That's why he said, if you believe, that was his will, see that? If you believe, then you'll, uh, you can get the birth. Right. You can get the new birth. All right, so it matches with James chapter 1, verse 18. James 1, verse 18, it says, of his own will begat he us, right? So we have to understand right here that it's from God's will. There's a divine side. There's a divine side to this. It's not your choice or your will. No one has the right to go to heaven. No one has the free will or choice to go to heaven just because you want to. You, it's not of your choice, hey, I believe in Jesus Christ and God's blood should wash away my sins and he should take me to heaven because I believe in Jesus Christ. No, he doesn't have to do all that. It's because of his own will to begin with from his own word that said you believe on Jesus Christ and your sins get washed away. That's why you can get all that. Amen. See that? So that's what you have to understand. It's the divine side. He's your father. It's not the act of man. It's the act of God. So go to Matthew 23 verse 9. Matthew chapter 23, verse 9. Hence, that's why you should never call man your father. See, a lot of people think that, well, you know, why can't I call my religious leader a father? Because he's the one that gave me salvation. That's the problem. See, they're looking at the act of man, man's will, that somehow gives them regeneration. You have to get that out of your head. It's completely a God thing. It's all of God. That's why he's the only one that should be appropriately called father. Not other people here. All right, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 9. The Bible says, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, 
which is in heaven. Only God, because he's the one that empowered you to become his son. Not some priest or religious leader. All right. Now we look at the human side. Okay, there's a human side. Go to John 1. So that's the second thing, the human side. Go to John 1. So why am I not a Calvinist? I mean, after all, it's all of God's will. Then uh, I get regenerated. No, it takes man's will as well. Yeah, the problem with people is they only look at, uh, they look at a partial picture. They don't look at the whole picture. There are two things involved here, all right, for your regeneration. It's the will of God and the will of man. That's why we're not Calvinists. Amen. Because the will of God must be implemented. You believe on my son, and because you do that, I can give you the new birth. Yeah, yeah. So then it takes your will yeah. Yeah. to follow God's will yeah. or to reject God's will. Yeah, right. See, Calvinists think that uh, God just forces people, you know, to get saved. You know, R.C. Sproul is such a philosopher and he can give cute little sayings that people think regeneration means that when you go kicking and screaming and I don't want to go to heaven, that God takes you to heaven anyway. No. And then he says the pious saying that it's because God gave you a desire to believe on his son and you want to believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. That's, that's just a nice pious way of saying that God forced you to get saved. See, they just cover up with pretty words, okay? All right, John chapter 1, verse 12. All right, look at verse 13, right? That's the favorite Calvinist passage, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. See, your free choice had no involvement on that. It's all a God thing. God willed for you to get saved. They forgot verse 13 says which, right? So they didn't read verse 12. Verse 12, but as many as what? <laughs> to them gave he what? Power. Power to become the sons of God. Regeneration. So, rege so believing, receiving on Jesus Christ, when you do that, then you become regenerated. Calvinists, they teach the heresy that regeneration precedes faith. Re regeneration precedes receiving Christ for salvation. What do they mean by that? What they mean by that is that God forced, uh, God somehow put inside you a will. So this is a nice cute saying from R.C. Sproul, you know. At the heart of Reformed theology, this axiom resounds. Axiom, yeah. <laughs> Regeneration precedes faith. See, it sounds Christian. That's why suckers will say amen to this. Suckers will nod their head. If I say cute little words like this and use words like axiom, regeneration, faith, these are signal Christian words that you might fall for. Hey, look at that book. Let me tell you this. I could be lying to you. If some of you are like, oh, you're too much, good, good. You're now thinking critically of me. Now prove it. Look at that verse. Prove me wrong. All right? Finally, you're not just nodding your head in agreement with me. That's perfectly fine because now you're starting to think critically. I like that. Now I want you to look at the verse and then see. See if what I'm telling you is the truth or not. See, I'm not all about you like me or not, all right? Because it's not about me feeling good. It'll make me feel bad if you don't like me after this because I want to be everybody's friend. I love everybody. I want you to grow in Bible-believing knowledge and truth. I want everybody to get saved. But see, then it will be a selfish thing on my part if I just want positive reception from you. That's my fleshly selfishness. I can't go for that one. What I care more about is you find the truth whether you like me or not. That's what I want. That's more beneficial for you. So will you please? Will you now please? If you're going to find that truth, look at that book and see if I'm telling you the truth or not, okay? Now, regeneration does not precede faith then. We see right here that in verse 12, when you receive Christ for your salvation, when you believe on him, then what happens is that's why in verse 13, then you get born from God. All right, let's see right here, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. 
Now, the Catholic Church, what they're going to try to argue is, well, don't the Jews call uh, Abraham their father, Father Abraham? And some of them might use <coughs> other arguments that don't we talk about our founding fathers of America? And obviously, don't you call your earthly father, Father? So Matthew 23 doesn't mean that uh, you can't call nobody Father. Uh, a funny argument that some people in the South will say, well, I don't call my daddy Father, I call him Daddy. So that's how they get around that one. <laughs> but obviously, that's not what it means, right? So they do have a, they do have a valid point, okay? So they have a valid point that you cannot just, uh, that doesn't mean that you can call earthly people uh, father or not. It has nothing to do with that. But here's the idea. In 1 Corinthians 4, 15, we see a truth to this. The idea is, we know what it's talking about when it says father. We tied it to regeneration, right? So it has to do with spiritual birth. See that? So it has to do with spiritual father. The only allowance that God will allow for father in the spiritual sense is 1 Corinthians 4.15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many what? Fathers. For what? In Christ Jesus. See, getting saved again. I have begotten you what? Through the gospel. So Paul says that he can give birth to them, but not because it is his act, all right? It is because, right here, he says, through the gospel. He says, in Christ Jesus. What do we see again? A divine side, but a human side that implements that. So that's very important to understand. So uh, the problem with people nowadays is that they look at their religious leaders as something as if they're talking to God. That's extremely dangerous, see? You have to keep looking at God as your father, God that gives you regeneration. The only time you can look at that religious leader or the person who led you to Jesus Christ is simply a human vessel or tool. It's that simple. By the way, those Catholic priests should not be called fathers anyway because in verse 15 it says through the gospel. They don't give you the right gospel. So you should not call them father. As a matter of fact, the priest should call you father. All right. All right, so let's look at 1 John 2. 1 John chapter 2. All right, 1 John chapter 2. And then uh, verse 29. Truth is truth whether we like it or not, right? Truth is truth whether we like it or not. All right, 1 John chapter 2. Now, this is a very important... The next two sections are the most important. The next two sections are the most important. 1 John talks so much about regeneration. So the book that you want to go to for regeneration is the book of 1 John. So when we look at 1 John... The next section is evidences of regeneration, all right? We're going to talk about evidences of regeneration. Okay, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 29. The Bible says, if ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. So notice right here that in 1 John uh, chapter 2 verse 29, we see... The search word, when I search word it, everything that has to do with born. So these are the signs. These are uh, signs of how you know that person is a born-again Christian. I mean, it's pretty obvious in the eyes of the world, right? Is that if you see a person, according to 1 John 2.29, a person who wants to live right, a person who tries to do something holy, what's the the thinking in that lost person's mind. Oh, that guy must be a Christian, right? They see you read the Bible. They see you pray. They see you go into church. They, they have the idea, oh, that guy might be a born-again Christian. See, that's your evidence to show them that you're a born-again Christian. But see, a lot of you who don't do that, and they see you like their ordinary neighbor, 
You have no evidence to show them that you're a born-again Christian. And they're going to think that you're just as lost as they are. All right, go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. Another evidence is a born-again person, a sign of it, his evidence, he hates sin. He hates sin. Amen. Notice right here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So notice right here that there is a dislike, an opposite, and hatred for sin. If they see you smoking, drinking, dancing with them, how is that lost person going to see you as a born-again Christian? But if they see you, no, I can't drink that, what's that lost person going to assume? Oh, what, are you one of those born-again Christians? Yeah. See, you gave him evidence that you are. Gave him evidence that you are. Okay, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. So, why is there evidences of regenerations? The reason why is because, remember 2 Corinthians 5, 17, there's a new creature in you, the Holy Spirit. So without the Holy Spirit, see that? You're unable, remember I told you that earlier? You're unable to do uh, good works, spiritual things, stay away from sin, change your old ways. But now that you have the Holy Spirit in you, that's why now there's something in you that is grieved when you sin. You know what I'm talking about? When you sin, something bothers you, don't, doesn't it? When you hear preaching, why does it convict you? When you were lost, didn't convict you. You were just like mocking, poking fun at it. And now it convicts you. Why is it that uh, there's something in you, even though when you sin, even when you sin, there's something in you that says, man, I wish this would stop. Why is there something in you that says, man, I want to go to church? See that? That's evidence of regeneration. So these things are called evidence to not just show the lost world that you're saved, but to even assure you of your salvation. See, because you didn't have that before when you were lost. But now that you have those things, those things should assure you of your salvation. They should be evidence that you're a saved, born-again Christian. All right, 1 John 4, 7, a born-again person would love God and others. The Bible says, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He didn't have that before. 1 John 5, 4. 5, 4. Notice right here, a born-again person would live in victory. So he lives much differently from before in defeat. He tries to live victoriously. So in 1 John chapter uh, 5, verse 4, the Bible points out right here that uh, whosoever is born of God overcometh uh, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, 1, the next one, 1 John 5, 1. A born-again person would believe Jesus is the Christ. A born-again person would believe Jesus is the Christ. The Bible says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also, that is, begotten. All right, so we see right here, these are evidences of regeneration. Now we come to security of regeneration. Security of regeneration. Now this is going to sound a complete opposite, which I want your undivided attention on, okay? So the important thing to establish about the security of regeneration is that People like Ray Comfort and others, they love the book of 1 John because they like to use this where people can doubt their salvation. Retread, say, believers. Why? Because, understand this, because they don't see evidences, right? Because they don't see evidences, then you are not saved. That's what they're going to insist. That's what they're going to assume. Why? Because we saw those verses. We saw those verses in 1 John, that uh, if you're born of God, you would love God. If you're born of God, that you would hate sin. If you're born of God, then you would love the Lord. If you're born of God, blah, 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 blah. So that's the reason why 
a lot of the people, they're going to get so confused and they're going to doubt their salvation. All right, so uh, there are two answers to this, all right? One answer is the book of 1 John, we know, has much tribulation reference. So because it has a lot of tribulation reference, those verses, those doctrines are applicable for Jews in the tribulation or saints in the tribulation. They have to do these things in the tribulation. Why? Because they cannot be the family of the Antichrist, the seed of the Antichrist. Do follow the works of the Antichrist. Follow his system, the ways of the world. You saved Christians are doing that right now, following the ways of the world. But if the Antichrist took it over and that you were going through the tri tribulation, you take that mark of the beast and you're part of his worldly system. See? That's why there's a lot of works involved in salvation, not just faith in the tribulation. So tribulation salvation is very different from Christian salvation. So that's the one answer. Uh, but there's a second thing to keep in mind. The second thing, however, is that height, there's a group called Mid-Acts or Hyper-Dispensationalists. Mid-Acts or Hyper-Dispensationalists, because they assume that entire book is for tribulation Jews, then they're going to cut it off and take out any verse that can be applicable for a saved Christian. Just because we know that the book of 1 John can apply to tribulation saints does not mean that there is not a single verse in there that a Christian can apply to himself or herself. Do you know why 1 John has verses that can apply to a saved Christian? You might say, why? Because it talks about regeneration. Didn't you know there are mid-acts who deny this basic doctrine about born again? They think born again is for Jews only, not for Christians. This is a basic doctrine then what are you going to do with Paul's epistles? We saw Paul's epistle. Mid-Acts loved the Apostle Paul's writing. We saw Corinthians, right? Chapter 5, 4, Galatians 6, etc. There is no doubt Paul was talking about new birth references. Mid-Acts are very prideful people. They think they know more dispensationalism than you Bible believers, but they don't even know a basic doctrine like regeneration. See that? So they're totally off on that one. All right. So we see right here that we can put 1 John for tribulation references, but another thing is this. Another way around it is that this is called what? Evidence. So here's the thing. In court, you may not have evidence to prove that you're innocent, but that doesn't mean that uh, you're not in innocent. See that? But they want to see evidence to prove that you are, right? It's the same thing for a saved believer. It's one thing uh, that you are a saved believer, but here's the honest truth. Nobody knows except you and God. Yeah, right. Only you and God would know because you're the one that chose to believe on Jesus Christ and did it that day. But the lost world around you never saw that. The lost world around you never uh, knew about that. But if you told them, see that? I believe on Jesus Christ for my salvation. See, you gave your evidence to them. That's why the signs or one of the evidences of regeneration that I told you before is those who believe Jesus is the Christ. See that? So that's one answer. But the other thing also is 1 John recognizes that even when a person sins, that doesn't mean they're not born again. You might say, why is that? Because the book of John is only focusing on your spiritual birth. It's totally ignoring your fleshly nature. So it proves eternal security. It doesn't make you doubt eternal security. It doesn't make you doubt your salvation. All right. 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. 1 John 5, 18. All right, let me wrap it up. All right, let me wrap it up here. So there are three verses. One is John 3.3. 3. You can write that down. We're not going to turn there because we already saw it. But John 3.3 3 is the only condition for you to miss heaven is if you're not born again. All right? That's the only way that you're going to miss heaven. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born. So it shows the only thing. All right? Then uh, if you got born again... 
how can uh, a born again Christian can't be not born again? If you got born again, it's too late. What are you going to do? The only way you can revert that process is go back to the past. The act was already committed, born again. So <laughs> whether you like it or not, you could sin after that. You could deny Jesus Christ. You could say, well, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore. But you're not going to undo that process. It's too late. You got born again. See? So that's security right there. Whoever heard of being unborn again? No such thing. See, you can't unborn yourself what's been born. All right, now 1 John 5, 18. 1 John 5, 18. So that's the first security. The second security is this. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Oh, man, well, I've sinned. So, well, no, 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 keep reading. But he that what is, uh, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself and that wicked one toucheth him not. Why, obviously, we can see right here that our flesh keeps sinning. And the devil, he touched our fleshly body many times, right? Like he did with Job's body. But what can't he not touch then? Your soul. That's the you he's referring to. See that? So the thing that verse 18 is referring to is your, what? Begotten nature. Your born of God nature. Not your physical birth nature. It's talking about your spiritual birth nature here. So the reason why you cannot sin, God doesn't see you as a sinner, but I've sinned in my flesh so many times. No, God's not looking at that. He's looking at your spiritual nature. All right, the other one is uh, 1 John 3, 9. 1 John 3, 9. The verse says you cannot sin. What do you think that means? That means you never sin. Come on, I don't care how well you live your life as a safe Christian. Everybody sins. Then what does 1 John 5, 18 mean? The only answer is your spiritual nature. That makes the most sense. That's why you can't sin. Because the you in the spiritual nature is not sinning. The you in your fleshly nature, though, is certainly sinning. All right, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9. Verse 9. This is a good one. Uh, the Bible says, oh, I'm in 1 Peter, sorry. Let me go back here. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Why? Here's the explanation. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So I already gave you the answer right here. The answer that is already given, let's put security is that your father can't make you not his son because the son is born with the biological seed of the father in him. Doesn't that make sense? So likewise, God the father can't make you not his son. Why? Because the son is born with the biological seed of the father in him. Hence, we see three reasons for security. One is, there's no such thing as unborn again. Illogical. This is a fallacy right here. Second thing is because God is looking at the spiritual nature that cannot sin. Spirit cannot sin. The third thing right here is referring to the seed in you. Yeah, you can sin all you want, but even children sin against their fathers. Okay. That doesn't make them not their son. They'll never change that fact because of the biological seed. If you got the seed of Jesus Christ, how are you going to undo that? Okay. See, there's no way on that. There's no way. So because of the seed in you, that's the reason why uh, you have to be born again. You cannot lose your salvation. That's the security. Okay, so we've seen right here Evidence of once saved, always saved, regeneration. Regeneration is commonly used, listen, regeneration is commonly used to make you doubt your salvation, to teach a false gospel, doing works, getting water baptism. So we learned that regeneration is the total opposite. Yeah. It should secure your salvation. Yeah. It should make you realize once I believed in Christ for salvation, I can't lose it, no matter 
what good work I may not do or how many sins that I commit. Even the evidence of regeneration builds up the assurance, not the doubt, actually. So this should even provide assurance, not doubt. You know why a lot of you are doubting your salvation? I can guess why. You're messing up. You wonder why you're doubting your salvation. That's what sin will do to you. Sin will not just make you suffer the consequence of sin. It will make you doubt your very own salvation that God secured within you. It will make you doubt, am I really God's child? Why? Because the child has not been in relationship with the father for years. Okay. He now forgets what the father looks like. Okay. That's good. If he's really his father, and he seems like a stranger to the father, and the father's ways and the son's ways don't seem to match up. You wonder why you doubt your, your sonship with God now. See? So anyway, security and evidence of regeneration should uh, help you with uh, the once saved, always saved, assurance of salvation and everything else and clear up many wrong doctrines. Okay, I am way over the time. God, my Father, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.